Greetings in the Messiah Yahweh, whom the King James Bible says Christ Jesus. And we do appreciate each and every one of you who has taken your time tuning this program. And we believe it will be a real blessing to you. At the end of the broadcast, we'll give you an address, telephone number, how to receive information. Matter of fact, we have a CD called The Father's Name in Literature that we send out along with it. And also have a CD called True Oneness. Matter of fact, when we're talking about oneness, you're going to fit in the category of either being oneness or trinity. But regardless whether you're oneness or trinity, the Old Testament talks about a name. And that Messiah said that I come in my Father's name. And the church today, overall, is being taught. Nobody knows how to say it. Nobody knows how to write it. It's hid. It can't be said. I want to go back again to the book of Acts 4.12. And we have been dealing with this same verse. This is probably about the third Broadcast. For me to understand Acts 4.12, I have got to understand how it got there. What name was it talking about? Who were the people that it was talking to? What did those people know? First of all, they were not Gentiles. They were Israeli people. Overall, we understand that they, there was the tribe of Judah. And we understand that you had Jeroboam and Rehoboam. And how Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, how Yahweh actually took the other tribes, the other ten. Of course, we understand that Judah stayed in Jerusalem with the tribe, uh, or the Levi, excuse me, the Levitical priesthood stayed in Jerusalem with Judah because that was where Yahweh, they, they, they had to stay where the temple was at, in other words. And the other tribes were, were scattered. Then overall, if you do any study, you find out then everything become to be Jews. And of course, that's really a modern word. But again, This message of the plan of salvation is so important because you've got to understand who he was talking to, who he was dealing with. Going over to the book of Acts 4.12 again, it says, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. This verse by itself understanding nearly 2,000 years ago that they didn't have a book of Acts written. This name it's talking about has been hid, has been covered up. That the church today is being taught Many names. Bible doesn't teach none of this kind of stuff. Remember, you're going to fit in a category of either being oneness or trinity. I want to go to the book of Matthew 28, 19 real quick. Then we're going to go back to what we've been talking about the week before about the Septuagint. Because this is going, this is means a whole lot. How has all of this come down to us? A lot of people has never even heard the word Septuagint. All right, in the book of Matthew 28, 19, this is what it says. Remember, just about every week we say that 
We're reading from a red letter edition King James Bible unless we say otherwise. So we're reading from a red letter edition King James Bible here. 28.19 says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name, N-A-M-E, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now, I just read it how King James says. Now, when you take the word teach, it comes from a Hebrew word called lamad. And actually, the way it's translated here, it would actually be called talmidim. Talmidim, it would be like a disciple, somebody that's in training. Somebody that's being instructed. Actually, it could be used to be taught, to be trained. When you really begin to understand this and follow the pattern of this and understand that The nations are going to be taught. But we find that in the book of Luke 24, 47, that it tells us that it's got to begin in Jerusalem first. Well, this is pretty much what the book of Matthew is telling us. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. If you're going to teach the nations, something's got to be taught, taught where you're at. Acts 4, 12 was given... Remember, they didn't have no book of Acts. But Acts 4.12, when it was quoted or said, would later on be written. Acts 4.12 was talking about what was going on among the Israeli people, among the Jews at that time. Acts 4.12 was talking about what happened in Jerusalem. He's not talking to Gentiles here. When you go study, you'll understand. See, there's so much in this, and I'm right now I'm wanting to put just emphasis on the name here. That Acts 4.12, that when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the resurrection of the true Messiah, he was strictly dealing with Israel. This message didn't belong to the world yet. This message didn't belong to the nations, the Goyim. It belonged to Israel. The churches today are not being taught this. They're being taught that God has many names. The name of Jesus is less than 250 years old. Never was even in the original 1611 King James Bible. So if it's less than 250 years old, it wasn't old enough to be a witness in this. And this give a witness to Jesus. Same way with the word I-S-U-S, Jesus, that was in the original 1611 King James Bible. Remember the, original, remember, the name of Jesus was not in the original 1611 King James Bible. But that that was there was called I-S-U-S. This here does not give witness to that. And then when you go back to the Greek I-S-O-U-S, known as E-A Zeus, this here does not give witness to that. So what did this give witness to right here? This is exactly what it gave witness to. This is the name, N-A-M-E, that the Messiah said that He come in. And a lot of people will just say, well, it's authority. Regardless, this name that's authority was the only name that was given for the plan of salvation. When you start studying Matthew 28, 19, where it says, Go ye therefore teach all nations. You've got to teach them something right. At that particular time when it said, Teach all nations, teach all nations what? 
Where are they going to teach the nations from if they did not have a written New Testament in any form? Remember this. There was no written New Testament in no form. How are you going to teach the nations? Remember this message first blown to Israel. Israel, from the Hebrew Scripture, would have to teach the nations. Before we go any farther, I want to go back to where we had pretty much left off the other week about the Septuagint. This is known as the Septuagint. In this Septuagint, this was a, a fragment of a Septuagint. A Septuagint is a word, a Latin word that means 70. It was written between the 3rd century and the 2nd century B.C. This here is a Hebrew Old Testament. It's written from Genesis to Malachi. Hebrew reads from right to left. This scripture is how the Gentiles, according to the book of Matthew 28, 19, would be taught. They were taught by Israeli Hebrew speaking men. So, we went through this last week. You had three phases that Hebrew has been written in. But it still has the same sound. The top is known as pictograph Hebrew. It's known as a yud hay wav hay. The next, this here in the middle, is known as middle script. It's known as a paleo. Still, it is yud hay wav hay. Still same sound. And then this is the block letter. This is what we've got up here. This is what the Tanakh, the day, is written in. This was pick, picked up after they come out of Babylon. Still the yud hay wav hay Hasn't changed. Still the same. Now, going back to the Septuagint. The Septuagint was the... Old Testament written in Greek, but it was translated from the Hebrew Scriptures. Let me go over this again with you. The Hebrew Scriptures were first. They were written really in this. Remember, it comes through three phases. This was used, pictograph was used up to around the 14th century B.C. Then afterwards, this paleo middle script began to come in. This is really pretty much what the Keith Vey, Hakodash, known as the Holy Scriptures, were written in. You can go back and study this for yourself. Then in, when Israel began to come out of Babylon, there was some Greek-speaking Jews at that particular time, Greek-speaking now, Greek-speaking is uh, Jewish people or Israeli people. Let's say it that way. So what they done? They took the scriptures, the Hebrew that was written like this at that particular time. And they translate it into Greek. You see these? These are Greek letters, Greek words. So that the Greek-speaking Jews that didn't know how to read Hebrew could read the Old Testament in their language of the Greek language. What is amazing about this is everything... That was written from Genesis to Malachi. Let's say it that way. Was written in Greek. The only 
part of the Septuagint that was not written in Greek was the name. Of course, at that time, it was written like this. Matter of fact, right there in that little area right there, I don't know that you can see it, but you can go online and you can find this. It's written with those letters of the Paleo Middle Script letters right there. That is amazing, folks. In other words, the translators of the Hebrew Scriptures thought so much of this name that they would not write it in Greek letters or any other letters. That's why it had to be written in one of these form of Hebrew letters at that particular time. And they have found that the Septuagints that they have found, the original Septuagints now, the original Septuagints were written with, the original Septuagint was written with this. Think about that. Nearly 7,000 times. To be accurate, it's pretty close around 6,828 times. Can you imagine this name here, or here, one of these forms, still the same name? Then, let me say it this way, then by the time that the Messiah was born, and then He started His earthly ministry at the age of 30, this Messiah, he, they still had the scripts like this, but they also was having it then beginning to be written in what you would call block letter. Then this block letter wind up taking over all of it. And this is what you have today. And this name is still in the block letter Tanakh today. It is. Once you can really understand this, now I want to paint a picture here. When the Messiah walked on the face of this earth nearly 2,000 years ago, and there was no written New Testament whatsoever, he had to have something that would give witness to him. I want to go over to the book of Matthew real quick. The book of Matthew 20 Oh, excuse me. The book of Matthew 3 and 3. Matthew 3 and 3. Remember, we're reading from a red letter edition King James Bible. Regardless if you're oneness or you're trinity, the plan of salvation is the same. Nearly 2,000 years ago, you didn't have all these denomination organizations. You didn't have the oneness coming against Trinity, Trinity coming against the oneness, because they believed in really in Deuteronomy 6 and 4, that there was one, only one Elohim, or as the King James says, one God. So the oneness, by believing there's one God, they picked up pretty much on the word oneness, and then the Trinity that believes that there's three... I don't know truthfully that real Trinitarian people really believes in three gods, but it started out that way. It really did start out trying to get the church to believe that there was three gods. All this started, was established, let me say that, this, by 325 A.D. I don't know if we'll get that far, but I want to go to Matthew 3 and 3. Let me read you something very important to you. Take your Bible. Follow along with us. Remember, we've got to understand our King James Bible the way it was written nearly 2,000 years ago. If we do, we're going to go back to this name. Why would we have something different? Why would the assembly be established on something different than what the early assembly was established on in the beginning? Matthew 3, 3 says, For this is he that was spoken by the prophet Elias. It says here in the King James, E-S-A-I-S. 
The Hebrew word actually is the word Yeshayahu, which is talking about Elijah. I mean, excuse me, Isaiah. Saying, now listen, this can be found in the book of Isaiah or Hebrew Yeshayahu. Saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now, I'm reading from a red letter edition King James Bible. The writer of the book of Matthew is going back to something. I said the book of Matthew, the writer of the book of Matthew is going to go, when he writes the book of Matthew, he's going to go back to get a witness of something. Remember, the Old Testament give witness of a Mashiach. It give witness of this. Never give witness no other name. Didn't even give the witness to Yeshua. Yehoshua, as that Messiah being, Yeshua, Yehoshua, all this stuff is nothing but, but confusion. When real, true Israeli people knows that the only Savior they've got is right here. That's the only rock that there is. Now, let's go over to the book of Isaiah, or Yeshayahu, from where Matthew 3 through, we just happen to choose Matthew, you got it. You find this same verse in, in, in the book of Mark and Luke and also John. Isaiah 43. Now, this is really where the writer of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote. They give witness from the scripture. The scripture is how the New Testament was produced. Remember that. The Scripture is how the New Testament was produced. People trying to do away. That's why I keep saying about Israel. You can't separate the church from Israel. Israel separated their self when they denied the true Messiah. But those that did accept the Messiah were Israeli. They were Jewish people, Israeli people. They were Israel. Their plan of salvation was given to the Gentiles. The only thing again is every one of them did not believe that the true Messiah had come to this earth. They didn't accept Him. But Paul says, boast not yourself against the natural branch. Do not, in other words, do not boast yourself against the natural branch because Israel was actually cut off so that the Gentiles, the Goyim, the nations could be brought in with the same gospel. Understanding this, this is what's amazing to me. The Gentiles are being, this is being hid from them today. It's being hid from them through, through like the word Jesus. Iezus and, uh, Iezus and Iezus in the word Jehovah. We need to understand what we understand. Isaiah 40 and 3 says, this is Isaiah 40 and 3 now from where Matthew 3 3 was quoted from. The voice of him that cried in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, the King James says, L-O-R-D. I want you to look at that real close. See right there where it says, the way of the Lord, L-O-R-D. When you go back to this of Isaiah, what we would have known as Isaiah or Yeshua Yahoo 40 and 3, you'll find this written there in the Hebrew Scriptures. The King James uses the word L-O-R-D. That's a cover-up. It also used in certain places the word God, G-O-D, cover-up. And the word Jehovah used seven times as a cover-up. Isaiah 40 and 3. Now this is John the Baptist. 
John the Baptist has come on the scene to prepare the way of Yahweh. Well, tell me who did he baptize and who was he preparing the way of? You know what they say today? They say his name is Yeshua. John didn't come preparing the way of Yeshua. Some people say, well, his name's Yehoshua. John didn't come preparing the way of Yehoshua. Some of them say his name's Jesus. John didn't come preparing the way of Jesus. Some of them say his name's Jesus. John didn't come preparing the way of Jesus. Some people say his name's Jesus. John didn't come preparing the way of Jesus. He come preparing the way of Yahweh. He baptized Yahweh in the river of Jordan. Now that right there, probably some of you might have just fell out of your chair if you was watching. This here shakes the world. Do you know that the majority of, of the calls that we get are positive? Because people are searching. You can't argue. You could argue with me, but you can't argue with the Scripture. The Bible says that John was prophesied in Isaiah, Yeshayahu prophesied that John would forerun, prepare the way of Yahweh. Nothing else but Yahweh. This is something to get excited about, whether you're oneness or trinity. It's a wake-up call. It's a wake-up call. Yahweh is not going to have something less than what He started out with. He's not going to have an assembly less than what He started out with and believe in less than what was taught in the beginning. Looks like that our time has come and gone. We have a CD called The Father's Name and Literature that we sent out along with it. We also have a, a, a CD called True Oneness. Matter of fact, if you need a prayer cloth, we'll be glad to send you a prayer cloth. We come on at this same time every week. The time that you are listening to us now is the same time we come on every week. So till the next broadcast, same time. We appreciate you. We love you. Shalom. You have just heard Hour of Truth with Brother Jerry. If you would like a copy of today's broadcast on DVD, of prayer cloth, or other information, phone 770-784-0703 or write 775 McDonald Road, Covington, Georgia, 30014. Until next week, we bid you Shalom.